Yeah, so welcome to the Web EV Talk Series. This is a talk series for EV enthusiasts around the globe. So today is the 6th April 2021, and it's my pleasure to welcome Associate Professor Meta Kruen from Duke University in the USA. So uh, Meta Research Laboratory at Duke has primarily investigated the molecular basis and functional properties for the secretion of bacterial vesicles. Uh, they developed methods to purify and analyze bacterial EVs and have developed and completed the first whole genome screen for vesiculation phenotypes in gram-negative bacteria in order to uncover the basic principles in vesicle biogenesis. In addition, they have investigated the eukaryotic cell pathways that are activated in response to bacterial EVs, including the innate, immune, and toxic responses of host cells so it's my pleasure to welcome Meta today, and she's going to give a lecture with title Bacterial Vesicle Mediated Interkingdom Communication. So welcome, Meta. Yeah, I've got the right button. <laughs> okay, thank you, Carolina. <laughs> Too many buttons. Um, I appreciate this opportunity to talk um, to a global audience. This is really exciting and a terrific, um, shall we say, silver lining to the COVID pandemic. So thank you everyone for um, coming at whatever time zone you're in. I really appreciate your company. For me this evening, for you maybe the morning. <laughs> um, so typically at Duke, um, hopefully you can see um, what it uh, looks like for us. Oops, um, let's see if I can get my uh, tools, no? I don't have the tool. Okay, um, so typically um, Duke University looks very nice um, in the spring, particularly it's all blooming right now, a lot of pollen in the air. Um, but unfortunately we don't see any of this at the moment because we're all still in our homes, but um, we are all still healthy and, and that is something to be grateful for, for sure. Um, at, in, in the evening, like now, something like this is what you would see out of um, our window, um, looking out on the um, Piedmont of um, North Carolina, where Duke University is located. Um, so I am um, interested tonight um, to talk to you about bacterial vesicle mediated inter kingdom communication. Um, I, this has become a um, rapidly emerging topic of interest in the laboratory, and I think it's been a lot of fun um, to follow. So I hope that you have some questions at the um, at the end also uh, regarding this topic. So the brief outline of what we'll talk about um, this evening is um, an introduction to bacterial vesicles. So we're all on the same page. Uh, for those of you who are interested in eukaryotic EVs, extracellular vesicles, uh, I want to introduce you to bacterial vesicles. Um, and then I'll briefly um, just tell you about some individual studies regarding interkingdom interactions that we've been studying over the years. An old one, but a good one, about um, phage interaction with vesicles from bacteria, and then some recent studies in, of the interactions of um, bacterial vesicles with mammalian cells and with plant cells. So we are really um, exploring lots of different types of cells at the moment. It's been a lot of fun in the past couple of years. And then some thoughts about future directions. And I'm, I'm very eager to hear your, your thoughts about future directions as well. Um, so as we know, just to introduce um, the ecosystem that we live in, um, bacteria live everywhere amongst ourselves, um, the uh, human population, also amongst the animal population, of course, in the environment, in um, and amongst plants, in the soil, in the trees, in the foliage, um, everywhere in the insect world, um, bacteria everywhere. They're even in clouds. Um, so bacteria literally are present in every single um, aspect of our world. And so it is not surprising that they have developed numerous uh, mechanisms in which to communicate with all of those um, other kingdoms around them. 
and the innate um, uh, objects and, and um, environment as well. But we really are studying the, um, the living organisms that they interact with at this point. And typically when we think of bacterial secretion mechanisms, we think about soluble material. So for years I study, uh, I, I, I teach um, lectures about bacterial secretion mechanisms and you can keep numbering them. They keep going up in number, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, these secretion systems that bacteria use to secrete material into the outside world are typically um, used to secrete soluble material. So soluble protein, soluble nucleic acid, soluble macromolecules, polymers, metabolites, et cetera. So that's how bacteria typically are thought of as interacting with their environment by secreting through these very complex, very interesting, very intriguing, um, energized, systems by which material gets translocated from the cytoplasm, let's say of a gram negative bacteria through two membranes and out into the world or even directly into another cell. So this has been studied for a long time um, and is continuing to lead to really important discoveries in the field. But what we're interested in here and what I presume you're all interested in learning about is um, the role of extracellular vesicles in transport. They can be used as transport vehicles as well by bacteria. And so we add them to the growing list of um, secretion systems, um, maybe type zero secretion system um, has been proposed. Um, this is a secretion pathway for insoluble ma material. So this will include lipids, things that are not typically thought of as being secreted by a bacterium. Um, an advantage of secreting material through a extracellular vesicle is that it provides a single bolus of a complex mixture of compounds. It can be addressed specifically to a distal site, a site distant from a bacterium. So it can travel much further than a bacterium can. Um, and it can provide a particular addressing, so an ability to interact via specific ligands on the vesicle surface with a particular cell uh, that um, in, in its environment. And that has always been of interest to me as I've been studying bacterial pathogens for most of my career. And I'm always interested in figuring out new ways by which pathogens interact with host cells and deliver particularly toxic or inflammatory components to those um, mammalian host cells. These vesicles, however, can also provide membrane bound protection against an environment. So although there are harsh environments, let's say in the human gut or in the environment out in the world, in the soil, in the water, um, pHs are changing, um, salt concentrations are changing. There's proteases, nucleases, all kinds of degradatory, degradatory um, components out there. The vesicles can offer a modicum of protection against environmental uh, attack. So we have studied these vesicles now um, for uh, a two decades um, in my laboratory, and we've taken some scanning EMs and some um, transmission EM uh, photographs of the vesicles that we study from bacteria, and we've come to appreciate that they can do an amazing number of things and um, the list kind of keeps growing in our book. Um, so vesicles, um, to step back a moment, are produced by all uh, forms of life, eukaryotes, as well as archaea, as well as prokaryotes. Um, they're called a multitude of terms. I'm sure uh, in this forum, you've heard of many of them, microvesicles, exosomes, membrane vesicles, outer membrane vesicles. Um, so um, in any event, what they are are released um, particles um, of um, membrane enclosed material um, that are um, derived from an originating cell. So I've shown here a gram negative cell, um, budding vesicles off of its surface um, <clears throat> that go on into the world and 
perform a variety of functions, virulence associated functions I've been interested in for a long time. In other interactions with hosts, some of these might have to do with commensalism, um, communication with the host. They also um, impart um, advantages to the bacterium themselves. And that's a whole different story. I don't have time to really talk about that today. Um, they offer a mode of stress relief for the bacterial cell envelope. So it, it, they provide a means by which the cell can release toxic material, toxic material to itself, not to a um, other cell. But in this case, it's, it's serving the interest of the bacterium that's actually producing it. And then um, also self-serving, if you will, is the ability of vesicles to acquire nutrients and also to engage in quorum sensing to figure out, uh, help figure out by um, delivering and um, uh, accepting, um, receiving um, chemical signals that are involved in quorum sensing to determine population density and turn on and off um, various aspects of the cell population in, that are dependent on those aspects. So vesicles can do a multitude of functions um, as far as bacteria goes, and certainly even more when you multiply it by all the different kingdoms um, that produce vesicles. But we are interested in my lab about on uh, vesicles that are produced by gram-negative bacteria and gram-positive bacteria, mostly gram-negative bacteria. Now we've um, delved into some gram-positive bacteria as well. Um, so these vesicles we define as detached spherical blebs that are derived from intact bacterial envelopes. So um, I've depicted that in this cartoon form in our whimsical imagination. This is how we imagine vesicles form. They bulge out somehow. There's some sort of pinching off mechanism and then a vesicle is released. It's, and then the vesicle can go off and do what it will in the environment. And if this occurs um, uh, on the surface of gram negative, it's going to be the outer membrane of the two membranous um, envelope of the gram negative cell, like E. coli, that buds off. And that vesicle will have the inherent properties of the outer membrane, which is an asymmetric bilayer um, and then composed of um, proteins that are integral to that membrane, as well as luminal components that are part of the periplasm of the um, gram negative cell. Distinct from that are gram-positive membrane vesicles, which are much more similar to eukaryotic cell EVs that are derived from the plasma membrane, um, because um, these are composed of the typical phospholipid bilayer, integral membrane proteins, alpha helical membrane proteins, as opposed to the beta barrel, outer membrane proteins found in gram-negatives. Um, they have lipid-associated proteins, um, and they have um, luminal components that are derived from the cytoplasm of those bacterial cells. So we're still learning a lot about the different components of these various um, uh, types of vesicles, and um, you'll hear something more about that um, more specifically in a moment. So very early on, we have looked at um, uh, the production of vesicles just by um, both scanning electron microscopy and atomic force microscopy. I just wanted to show you these pictures because they, um, you know, pictures um, are worth a thousand words or something like that, um, where we're actually observing the budding of a vesicle in the scanning or this um, atomic force microscopy of a living E. coli cell. It's at 20 degrees, so it's, it's cold uh, temperature, relatively speaking, but you can watch as, um, Claretta Sullivan was um, imaging these um, just E. coli, DH5-alpha wild type E. coli cells. She could see a vesicle budding off of the surface and getting released. And, re and as a consequence, there was no um, uh, sort of lysis of the cell. And we were very pleased to see that because in all of our bi biochemical assays, we're really very careful to be working with non-lysed cell populations. We want to be looking at vesicles that are produced by living cells, not during a, uh, the um, 
uh, cell lysis procedure, and which generates a different type of vesicle. Uh, and teratoxygenic E. coli is shown here that it was harvested back from the guts of uh, mice. So we inoculated mice with enterotoxigenic E. coli and then harvested them back out again and looked at them by scanning EM and you could see all these vesicles on the surface of the ETEC in this image. So those were satisfying images to show that vesicles are really budding from the bacterial cell surface without the loss of cell integrity. Um, just an overview of how we, how we isolate and purify vesicles from bacterial cultures is very straightforward, as you um, might expect. Um, we grow cultures in whatever volume is required <laughs> to get the appropriate yield of the outcome. Essentially, we're using um, bacteria that are in their mid-log growth phase so that they're not dying, they're not lysing. Um, uh, that's in general, depends on what experiment we're doing. Pellet the cells, the vesicles, and other secreted material will stay in the supernatant. Then um, we'll filter that out, get a sterile uh, filtered supernatant that is then ultra centrifuged to a pellet at 150,000 times G. And then we uh, um, take that pelleted material and we can float it in a, a density gradient, typically octoprep. Um, is our gradient of choice, which is osmotically favorable to not lyse those vesicles. And then um, you can spin that uh, in an ultra centrifuge and the um, proteoliposomes will float up into this gradient to some particular density. Depends on the cell type, depends on um, the strain, all kinds of things. But essentially it will separate away these proteoliposome containing vesicles um, from the soluble components that are not membrane associated. And so you can fractionate these from the top down. And then, um, so the lightest density fractions to the lower density, to the heavy density fractions, and then uh, analyze them by protein content, lipid content, nucleic acid content, activity assay, whatever you want. You can um, look at the, uh, these various fractions in a lot of different ways. Um, and one way that you probably are familiar with looking at vesicles is by electron microscopy. So we can um, analyze these by transmission EM, just negative staining, and ascertain their diameter. So typically for bacterial membrane vesicles, they have a diameter of approximately 50 to 250 nanometers. Some samples are much more heterogeneous than other samples, which are more homogeneous. Um, these um, their amount and the heterogeneity of the vesicles depend on the species, the strain, the conditions. Um, there isn't often a real rhyme or reason to um, what we see. Um, we report what we see and um, the heterogeneity in some cases is there and not in other cases. And it would be interesting to know what that is due to. Um, we measure the um, yield by protein, Bradford assay lipid by FM464, typically a fluorescent lipophilic dye or transmission EM, we can measure the vesicles and count them um, uh, that way. Um, just to show you um, some aspects of um, bacterial vesicles, um, they contain select envelope cargo. Um, in other words, a subset of the, the envelope compart components are contained in the vesicles. Um, so for instance, for E. coli, which is a gram negative organism, a subset of E. coli, e. coli LPS is present. Um, phospholipids are present, the inner leaflet. Um, outer membrane proteins, again, a subset is present. Um, paraplasmic proteins are um, represented in the vesicles, peptidoglycan we think is present. Um, surface associated proteins are definitely present on the vesicle. We've studied those in detail in numerous cases. And now we're looking at nucleic acids specifically from gram positive bacteria. This is just a simple example of what I mean by selective protein content. Um, the protein content running this SDS page gel of the vesicles is distinct from that of the outer membrane, from the originating membrane. It's similar, but distinct. So um, again, the 
the exact protein species that are present in this case of Pseudomonas aeruginosa um, vesicles depend on which um, particular strain that you're um, isolating vesicles from. But you will see some conserved um, components and some um, highly um, enriched or depleted components. And um, this is one of the, the many questions that remain to be asked is, what governs the enrichment or the depletion of particular components into vesicles? This is really a fascinating um, aspect of the membrane vesicle biogenesis that we just simply don't know yet, those rules. Uh, we have studied the um, composition, the lipid composition of vesicles specifically for Salmonella. And I could just show you this example here where um, Catherine Bonington in the lab um, was really interested in the role of uh, vesicles and lipid remodeling of the outer membrane. And just super briefly, and this doesn't do her work um, nearly the justice it deserves, but um, what she ch chose to look at was the change in the membrane uh, composition of rapidly dividing cells from a minimal media to a um, at a neutral pH and high magnesium concentration to a acidic pH 5.8 and a low um, magnesium sulfate concentration. And when salmonella undergoes this shift, it changes its LPS. And so we were curious, this outer leaflet lipid that's so important for salmonella to um, be able to survive in these conditions, what is it doing with the old LPS essentially? What's it doing with the LPS that it used to have? And so um, Catherine studied that by looking at the outer membrane vesicles that were produced under these conditions um, over time, right? And eventually these cells change their LPS because they change their whole transcriptional framework and generate a new type of LPS that has different modifications. And what she found in a nutshell is that the LPS that's secreted in the vesicles that are shown here at 30 and 60 minutes is very distinct from the LPS that's found on the bacterium at that time. So the rest of the time course that's sort of underlying this from zero to 120 minutes, two hours, um, shows the, the LPS on this TLC plate, all these different LPS species of the bacterial cell are changing. It's going from a very uncomplicated pattern to a very complicated pattern. So the salmonella changes its LPS very distinctively. Meanwhile, the vesicles appear to be enriched in the uncomplicated form, um, the old form of the LPS, if you will. So the vesicles appear to have selectively um, the ability to export particular types of lipid A of the LPS, this lipid uh, in the outer leaflet of the outer membrane. And again, um, this is similar. Um, the, the composition of the lipid is similar to the membrane of origin, but it's specific. It's particularly enriched or depleted in particular components. Again, a really interesting point of interest for um, understanding how these vesicles form and how they are incorporating particular components in them. We don't know exactly how they do this. But what I want to talk to you really about um, tonight is the Rest, the, the functionality of um, bacterial vesicles um, in the world and it, as they interact with other um, entities. And so I thought I'd start with a very simple story of the interaction of phage with vesicles that we started years ago um, with Andy Manning in the lab. And he was curious about anti bacterials. So phage, if you will, are antibacterials or antimicrobials. They attack bacteria like antibiotics do. They, um, they need to um, enter into cells via an external receptor, a membrane-bound receptor. So we thought, well, vesicles could act as decoys for phage. Um, they could essentially um, bind up um, phage um, and lead them down in um, non-productive pathway. 
So um, Andy decided to test this and he just used a simple system of E. coli and T4 phage. He pre-incubated phage with vesicles derived from E. coli. Um, and then he looked at the plaque forming units um, that were made um, from those phage. And so we set, you know, hundred percent plaque forming units for a 10 to the six T4 phage that he had. Vesicles themselves didn't create plaques on these plates as we expected. Um, this is the tighter 10 to the fifth um, T4 phage would make only 10% of the 10 to the sixth T4 phage. So we had uh, plaque forming units that were uh, undergoing exponential um, amount of plaque forming units. That was our controls. And then we looked at our 10 to the sixth T4 phage that had been pre-incubated with vesicles and then allowed to replicate on this recipient auger. And we found that we found that 10% um, of the phage were um, able to make plaques at the end point of just having a five minute pre-incubation um, between the phage and the vesicles. So in five minutes, 90% of the phage were taken out of commission, which was extraordinary. Um, and so we actually did a, a time course to see, well, are these completely taken out? Or is this a reversible interaction? Because is it, are they just bound and then they're gonna be released and then the phage are free to infect cells? And it turns out that no, um, we saw a decrease that just um, kept decreasing. Uh, so the longer we incubated, the less phage we're able to infect cells. So this is an irreversible binding. Um, and that really reduces the ability of T4 to infect bacteria. And then Andy captured this process beautifully in this electron micrograph that he took of phage interacting with our vesicles in our preparation. So that was really fun to see. Okay, so um, more um, recently, um, I have had a student in the lab who's been terrific, Blanca Rodriguez, who's been interested in looking at the transfer of genetic material um, from bacteria to uh, other um, cells. And um, she was particularly in, um, intrigued by some um, reports um, of uh, previous studies that suggest functional roles for vesicle-associated RNA and DNA. Um, so this is a summary of this um, study that indicated that vesicles from Pseudomonas aeruginosa could contain um, some sRNAs, small RNAs that might um, impart some immunomodulatory um, function on an airway cell, an epithelial cell. Um, but these studies did not show this directly um, as far as um, the, the vesicle DNA or the vesicle um, RNA, sorry, um, could be transfected into these cells, but it wasn't clear that the vesicles were actually doing the, um, the, the actual transmission of the information, but that was intriguing. And then there was other um, uh, implications here in the scientific reports of really important um, work showing that EDU labeled OMVs um, were internalized into A549 lung epithelial cells. So this was super intriguing to us that these vesicles could contain nucleic acids and enter into mammalian host cells. Um, so we thought we'd pursue this in a um, simpler situation um, using a gram positive uh, organism rather than a gram negative, because for gram positives, um, they would package just the cytoplasm, as I told you before, rather than paraplasm. And we didn't, wouldn't have to deal with trying to figure out where nucleic acids were coming from um, in the paraplasm or in the lumen of outer membrane vesicles. So Blanca um, moved to study Staphylococcus aureus vesicles. Staph is a serious gram positive opportunistic human pathogen. Um, it's a leading cause of skin and soft tissue infection in the U.S. Um, it produces vesicles that have been um, previously um, characterized to some extent um, to contain a variety of bioactive molecules, and some of those references are shown here. And their proteomes have been studied um, fairly well. So um, what was interesting is also that Staphylococcus 
produces immunostimulatory nucleic acids. So it is a strong type one interferon inducer. Um, the CPG DNA uh, induces a TLR9 dependent response. tRNA and ssRNA um, induce a TLR7 and 8 response and rRNA induces a TLR13 response. So we wondered, um, this information was readily available in the literature that these um, nucleic acids from staph um, were inducing these immunomodulatory um, events, but how did the nucleic acid get from the staph into the host cell? And we thought vesicles were a reasonable um, medium by which they could be delivered into host cells. So we thought we would study that. So um, Blanca um, investigated Staph aureus MV. She isolated the vesicles from Staph aureus and um, uh, incubated those with macrophages. And she looked to see if they were immunomodulatory. So we chose raw uh, macrophages, simple um, in vitro model. Um, cultured to confluency and co-incubated those with uh, vesicles. And then um, over time, um, isolated the RNA from the vesicles to look at expression. And what we saw was that interferon beta RNA was um, expressed in response to vesicles shown in the blue, um, peaking at about three hours. Um, post-infection of the macrophages, and it occurred in a dose-dependent manner, so increasing amounts of vesicles. We got a dose-dependent increase in, in interferon uh, beta response. Um, other interferons um, did not show uh, reactivity to these vesicles, so they um, we did not see a response to um, interferon um, alphas um, in response to the vesicles. So this suggested um, that there was a significant um, immunomodulatory response in res to Staph aureus vesicles. And we thought we would um, investigate what was causing this response. Um, so Blanca just, um, wondered whether um, there was a nucleic acids that were present on the interior of the vesicle or if they were present on the exterior of the vesicle. Um, and in order to do that, um, she benzonase treated these, um, which is benzonase is a nucleic acid, a, nu a nuclease, um, which will um, digest amino uh, nucleic acids that are present on the surface um, or associated um, with the outside of the vesicles. And so she added these benzonase vesicles to cultured macrophages. And to our surprise, um, we found, yes, um, we got a significant decrease in the interferon beta response from the cultured macrophages to the vesicles, but it didn't go down to zero, not even close. This was still a very substantial, significant response. Um, so these vesicles from Staph aureus uh, harbor highly protected nucleic acids um, that are not able to be digested by benzonase. So the vesicles are potent um, vehicles for interferon beta um, uh, activation in macrophages. And so next we wondered what was, um, how they were getting into the uh, macrophages and what are the mechanisms of the transmission of nucleic acids into um, the macrophages? Was it via an endocytic compartment? So we tested dinosaur um, inhibition, dinosaur being an inhibitor of dynamin-dependent endocytosis. And we saw a big decrease in um, the uh, interferon beta response when we added dinosaur to um, those incubations, suggesting that a major pathway not the only pathway potentially, but a major pathway was via a clathrin um, dynamine mediated process of endocytosis. And this was consistent with some um, nice confocal um, EM that we had done 
using uh, an endosomal, early endosomal marker, um, which co-labeled uh, interior compartments of the macrophages with the RNA select cytostain that we had used um, in green. So the red early endosomal markers co-localized with the yellow um, cytostained MV um, population. So then we also were curious about um, what aspects of endocytosis would be involved in the signaling. Did we need acidification um, for, of the endosomal compartment to see a um, interferon beta response? And the answer was yes, we could um, uh, inhibit uh, acidification with baphlomycin and chloroquine and get a substantial and significant reduction in the interferon beta response. So acidification appears to be important in the uh, immune response to the vesicles. Um, we looked to see uh, whether it was dependent on TLR activity. So downstream of the TLRs in the endocytic compartment um, are MyD88 and TRIF. And so we used knockout um, bone marrow derived macrophages. And what we found was that in our controls, um, CPG DNA is susceptible to this knockout, and that was um, positive control. Uh, cyclic GMP was not, and that, that was our negative control in these assays. The vesicles um, were also um, substantially impacted by the lack of the MyD88 and TRIF, showing that the TLRs do seem to be involved in this um, pathway of activation of an interferon beta response. So next we were interested in which TLRs were involved. And so um, Blanca tested uh, knockouts in TLR3, TLR7, and TLR9. And the short answer is they're all seem to be somewhat involved in this um, process. Um, so these TLRs are sensing double-stranded RNA, tRNA, single-stranded RNA, tRNA, and CPG DNA. And um, so we are seeing um, dependence on sort of each of these in um, the signaling of interferon beta uh, in the macrophages um, dependent on these um, vesicles that are apparently delivering all of these components into the cell. So the summary to this point um, is that there's highly protected RNA and DNA associated with staph aureus vesicles and endosomal nucleic acid receptors are activated in these macrophages upon vesicle exposure and largely through endosomal RNA and DNA receptor signaling. And so for the last part, I just wanted to introduce to you another um, concept kind of going further afield in the interkingdom communication realm, thinking about bacterial vesicles and plants. And oops, um, so in this study, Hannah McMillan, who's another graduate student in the lab, um, decided that she wanted to know if vesicles uh, play an important role in the interaction of bacteria, either commensals or pathogens with plants. And so just to introduce really quickly to you, Pseudomonas syringae is a plant pathogen. Pseudomonas fluorescence is kind of considered a commensal, if you will. It's just sort of ubiquitous. It's also can be used in um, crop management um, in sort of a therapeutic um, sense. So um, you can think of it in, in the kind of yogurt sense of <laughs> it could be helpful um, in delivering therapeutics to plants. We studied um, the vesicles uh, that were produced from both complete media and minimal media. Suffice it to say here that there really wasn't much difference. Um, although we did the minimal media experiments because bacteria grown in minimal media tend to enhance their virulence characteristics and specifically for plant pathogens, type three secretion system is really important. So we wanted to study vesicles derived from both complete and minimal media. So we studied their characteristic size, their protein content, lipid content, et cetera. Uh, we didn't find a huge, um, marked difference in these, um, but we purified them and used them all in our experiments. Um, so the first thing to note, um, it, 
from our experiments was that the vesicles did no harm to the plants. So we infiltrated what Hannah does, she infiltrates these vesicles directly into the leaf of the uh, Rabidopsis, Thaliana leaves. And here you can see if you use buffer, your leaf is green. If you use PST, the syringi um, outer membrane vesicles and infiltrate them to leaves, the leaves are fine, as well as the fluorescence vesicles, the leaves are fine. Then, however, after this infiltration, if we challenge later with Pseudomonas syringi, the pathogen, what was interesting was that if we had only infiltrated with the buffer to begin with, the plant leaves are yellowed, they show disease. But if we pre-treated with the vesicles, that leaf yellowing does not exist. And you can calculate how much syringi is actually um, growing in those leaves um, using um, plant, uh, CFU measurements, as you would in a mammalian cell, epithelial cell, you know, infection experiment, something like that. And so what she found was a dose-dependent effect of if she pre-incubated with PST OMVs, um, she found increasing amounts of protection against this infection by PST. So more vesicles she added, the better protection against the pathogen. And what was interesting was that it wasn't just the syringi vesicles protecting against the syringi infection. The fluorescence vesicles, so from the commensal, if you will, could also protect against the pathogen growing in these leaves. So there's something about the vesicles that was eliciting a protective response. And what was even more interesting and compelling to think about is that we just, you know, we had a lab full of vesicles from all kinds of bacteria and we thought, well, we'll just try them and see, we'll see what we see. Um, so the syringae could protect very well um, in these experiments. Pseudomonas aeruginosa vesicles didn't protect nearly as well. And they're sort of related phylogeny, uh, phylogenic uh, to the pseudomonas syringae. Enterotoxigenic E. coli vesicles, which we've been studying for a long time for toxins and mammalian toxins and gut um, properties, these actually could protect quite well. So that was really intriguing. Staph aureus vesicles, they didn't protect so well. So we have yet to figure out what are the common components in protection um, that uh, these vesicles are um, delivering to the plants to activate some sort of protective immune response, but it's really interesting and compelling um, data to think about. Um, just to show you um, the types of assays that we do, we, the fractionation of the density gradient, we look at the activities of the, um, the various fractions uh, in our purification scheme. You can see where the protein and the lipid um, peak in our fractions from our density gradient. And you can see that um, we see a corresponding increased um, protective activity in the fractions that have higher amounts of protein and lipid. So the protection in the in vivo plant experiments tracks with where the vesicle containing fractions are. Um, we looked just on the side at the type three effectors because this is what um, a lot of plant biologists think about most of the time when I think of plant pathogens and we tested outer membrane vesicles derived from strains that do not express type three secretion effectors or the machinery or both. And what we saw was that it didn't matter if the type three secretion system was present or not, the vesicles were equally protective. And um, intriguingly, those um, just on the side, um, the strains that have type three deficiencies make a lot more vesicles. So this is our parent strain of um, bacterium. And these are the yields from all the other, um, from the type three secretion system mutants of bacteria. So something interesting is going on there, but it's not affecting their ability to be protective. The other thing that Hannah found was that these vesicles are super stable. So in the same way sort of that Blanca found that the nucleic acids were incredibly stable against nuclease protection, 
and could activate an immune response in mammalian cells. Whatever these vesicles were carrying is really stable in their ability to generate uh, protection in plants. Because she sonicated them, they had similar amounts of protection. She boiled them, she protonase treated them, they all were very, remained very protective. So we think potentially there's a small molecule rather than a protein that's involved in this protective response. And we're certainly interested in finding out what that or what they are um, and if they're the same for each of these species. And so um, the final experiment I wanted to show you was um, that there's cross protection against other pathogens as well. And this was kind of a fun experiment in which um, we were wondering how good is this immunity that the vesicles are eliciting? How protective is it? How broadly protective is it? So Hannah tried infecting with something completely different, not Pseudomonas syringae, but Hyloperonospora arabidopsis, a natural uh, pathogen of arabidopsis. And um, in this case, the PST, the syringae vesicles, were also able to significantly decrease the infectivity of this oomycete pathogen. And so we tried this in a different strain. We tried Phytophthora infestans infections of tomato plants, completely different. Um, so normally the tomato is infected by Phytophthora. If we pretreat the tomato leaves with PST or a fluorescence vesicles, we decrease the infectivity of um, Phytophthora for tomato leaves. So this is intriguing. We don't know what the components are that are important in this um, protective response. Um, we don't know if they're the same. It leads us to many, many downstream questions in this field. Um, the vesicles elicit unusual combinations of plant immune responses. Um, you can read Hannah's paper to find out more specifics about this. There's differences in activation between different species, maybe different cargo are getting released. Um, there's difference between this commensal and the pathogen interaction with plants. Um, so we can start to highlight different mechanistic um, landmarks um, in the signaling pathway. The, they elicit complex immune responses that might create, create this durable resistance in plants. And interesting, the vesicles also provide some new tools um, they allow us to look at type three secretion system independent immune activation, um, salicylic acid independent immune responses, as well as this non-protein component of immune elicitors. And so um, we're looking forward to thinking about using these as new tools also to probe growth defense trade-offs. I didn't have time to tell you about the growth inhibition aspects of the vesicles because when um, plants elicit an immune response sort of reciprocally, normally they, uh, that leads to growth inhibition. So the plant is, if you will, putting its resources into immune defense rather than growth. And so there's usually, at the time that you see um, pathogen protection, you will see seedling growth inhibition. What we saw interestingly in our studies is that these didn't always go hand in hand, which is quite interesting and revealing about the types of mechanisms that might be occurring in this response um, of, a, of a plant cell to these um, vesicle components. Okay, so I leave you with many, many questions, some of which are shown here um, of uh, things that are, we're thinking about for future work. What are the physiologically important RNA and DNA entities that are carried in these Staphylococcus vesicles? How are they liberated from the vesicle um, inside the enzyme? How do they become packaged into the vesicles? Um, do the staph aureus vesicles activate clinically important responses during an infection? And in the second part of the talk, what components of the plant protection inducing vesicles promote plant immune defenses? 
Is it the same component that's common somehow between all of these really different origins of vesicles from syringae and fluorescence and from enterotoxigenic E. coli? And is it the same component that's effective in different plant hosts, Arabidopsis versus tomato? Um, these are all intriguing questions that remain to be answered. And so finally, my last slide, I want to acknowledge uh, a wonderful team of scientists. I am always amazed at what they bring to the table every single day, even during a pandemic, uh, they just keep working hard. Um, Blanca, Hannah, uh, and Clarice. Um, Blanca's here and Hannah's here, Clarice in the lab now. Um, and Caitlin and Nicole are shown here as well. Catherine Bonington contributed to the L Lipid A um, data that I showed, Andy Manning to the phage studies, funding from NSF and Duke and NIH, and I am very appreciative of wonderful collaborators, both at Duke as well as at other universities. So I'm happy to engage in the discussion, answer questions, hopefully we might have. Thanks. Thank you so much, Meta. It was a wonderful talk. It was so fascinating the way the bacteria interact with the, um, the house at the microphage of the plant. And I think it's really um, the, the very intriguing questions is um, with, with that um, plant pathogens. I mean, why it actually elicits uh, protection because it's not necessarily beneficial for the pathogens. Um, do you have sort of comments on, you know, uh, or thoughts about it? Yeah, so the question of um, how is this, is this helpful for the host or is it, why would a pathogen generate something that would elicit an immune response to itself? To yeah. right, it yeah, that doesn't, yeah. that doesn't make sense, right? It, it, although you know, we don't have to look far, um, because the same thing happens in mammalian cells or in mammalian um, uh, hosts, right? We have bacteria that are infecting a mammalian host constantly and making vesicles, and we know our own vaccines that we use right now <laughs> against Haemophilus. Mm -hmm. Um, are composed of outer membrane vesicles, right? So these, the, the bacteria are making them, the hosts react to them in an immunologically important way. And they're, you know, they, they are presenting antigens certainly to the immune system that can be used as a um, uh, immunological tool for an adaptive immune response. Um, yeah, it seems to be, we, we are thinking of it as a, as a trade-off. Uh, there must be something in it for the bacteria, right? That keeps them producing these things, even though it can be detrimental to their eventual outcome. Um, and so, yeah, the, the ability of them to release vesicles as a stress response, I think is important at a basic level. Um, their ability to release toxins, um, to maybe acquire nutrients. Um, yeah, there must be a lot of advantages as well. Mm. Uh, yeah, uh, Jen Lee, do you have a question? Hi. Please go ahead. <laughs> you know the story already. <laughs> you're muted. Oh yeah, you're muted, Jen. Can you unmute yourself, Jen? Yeah. Yes, I, I only knew a part of the story. Um, <laughs> you made a comment about peptidoglycan being inside the vesicle. And I didn't know if that was OMVs or gram positive EVs or, and, and whether there was really good evidence for this. That is a great question. I've been looking for that evidence <laughs> for a while. There, um, I can't remember the exact reference. I was um there have been a few studies that look at um 
I think it was uh, labeled PG um, that they found present in their vesicle population. We haven't seen it ourselves and I don't have my own, you know, we don't have our own data regarding that. I think it's a really in interesting question. Even if PG was associated with the vesicles, whether it was externally associated or were some peptidoglycan precursors that were actually mm -hmm. detected, I don't think those earlier studies could distinguish between those. So yeah. it's a tough question. Um, yeah. can, I, can I ask you a second question? Since sure. I've got <laughs> um, I don't know that much about the OMVs and I, you had made, uh, you showed that nice slide with the bacterial uh, vesicles, the OMVs reacting with the phage, the T4 phage. Yeah. What, um, what receptor is the phage recognizing on those OMVs? That is a, another excellent question. And personally, I am not a phage aficionado. Um, and I thought this would certainly be a really simple thing to look up in the literature because phage have been studied for what, decades. Um, but in fact, the phage receptors is a bit of a murky literature. And so in this case, I believe that, well, there's the phage interact with, with the bacteria in, in a two-stage process. One is sort of the uh, low affinity um, feeling out, is this the right bacterium, sort of? Um, and then this, the second is the locked-in phage um, so that it actually injects its um, DNA. And so as far as I understand, the LPS, I believe, is involved in the first stage and, and protein in the second, but I couldn't ever really come up with the answer to that, um, which surprised me because I thought, this would be really well developed. Yeah. So you suspect that it may be the the LPS associated with the OMVs that may be causing them to sort of absorb the phage? Right. I think that's part of it, but I honestly I don't know. <laughs> because yeah, that that's what we had set out to look for is like, well, you know, can we have vesicles produced by a mutant that doesn't have the receptor? And it yeah. was, it was difficult for me to find it. Maybe someone else knows the answer to this, but yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, thank you. And Yumi, please go ahead with your question. Hi, uh, is this Yumi? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your very interesting talk. I and mean, I have two questions. The uh, first one was uh, the peripatetic uh, carbon is a uh, carbon is packed in alpha membrane vesicles, and you show that the three expression uh, effectors are not uh, attacked by OMVs. Actually, this is uh, I, I understand that you know the fibrillation system is really different, but uh, my question is uh, some bacterial fibrillation system that transport peripatetic carbon to a peripatetic is somehow linked to the secretion of an OMB, was OMB uh, contains peripatetic carbon? I don't, I don't think I caught the whole question. Did you, Carolina? Um, it's also written in the chat, uh, Meta. The oh, yeah. Thank you. OK, that helps. Um, is linked from um, the cargo transport. The is the periplasmic cargo selectivity um, selected from a particular population that's secreted in a particular manner um, through the cytoplasmic membrane? I don't think so. <laughs> I haven't seen ev any evidence for for a subpopulation of cargo that's selected um, via a particular route. Um, uh, yeah. uh, my, my question is, because, uh, uh, do, do you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, because the uh, peripatetic cargo is packed in outer membrane vesicles, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, my question is from um, uh, bacterial secretion system that 
uh, transport cargo from the cytoplasm to the periplasm and some genetically or functionally related to the secretion of our Oh, um, we don't have any evidence for that, for um, those transporters to be involved at this point. Yeah. But uh, the, I, I'm yeah. not sure if they yeah. are. They are. My, it, it do, uh, so many of them are essential that it's hard to be able to figure that out, I think, because you can't mutate them. So. And uh, you also show us a very interesting data that uh, only be somehow bind to trees. It's here you show the tip of trees, and then uh, the, the binding may uh, reduce uh, you know, activity of trees. And some of these are very unvarieded uh, insect with a variety of bacteria, but some fish not. Uh, do you kind of explain some sort of the uh, phase specificity by this, this such interaction or all these? So the phage specificity for particular bacteria. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah I I I'm not sure if that can explain like why a particular phage would not be um, infecting particular strains. I guess if, I mean, if they were making a lot of vesicles and had a lot of sort of cloud of decoys surrounding them, then mm -hmm. maybe they would be less susceptible to particular phage. Um, but I think that the bacteria inherently would be still susceptible to that phage if the vesicles weren't there. So. Um, but it's an interesting ploy. And um, personally, I, I started thinking about the interaction of vesicles and phage and their ability to then be trafficked further into host cells and sort of like, you know, now you've got sort of endocytosis of this complex and, and what are the downstream effects of that? Um, I thought that might be sort of interesting because then the phage are going where the bacterial vesicles are going. They're sort of trafficking along that way. Um, yeah, that's an interesting point. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you so much, uh, Yumi, for the questions. Um, I think it's the sounds is not really uh, delivered clearer because of the microphone. Yeah, it's hard. I so. I, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Hard. But uh, it's it's great that you actually, uh, you wrote the questions there, so we can follow it through. Uh, well, thank you so much again, Meta. It's wonderful uh, presentations, and also we learned so much about the uh, the role of bacterial vesicles. Either it calls OMV or MV, I guess, uh, depending <laughs> on the gram positive and gram negative. But that's really exciting um, and also given very clear description on what is the difference between those gram negative versus gram positive uh, vesicles and how they might contribute to the uh, inter-kingdom communications. That was wonderful uh, presentation. Thanks so much for sharing it with us.